Good morning, everybody. The subject of my presentation is uh, Cognitive Liberty and Drug Policy Reform. I will start giving some information about the Center for Cognitive Liberty and Ethics, which is a network of people who wrote a very interesting article about what is cognitive liberty. This organization has been uh, created by Richard Glenvoir and other people more than 10 years ago, and they created a website, uh, www.com cognitiveliberty.org, where it's possible to find uh, many articles and resources about cognitive liberty. The first part of my presentation is based on an article that I read on this website. And uh, I will start with uh, an article written by Richard Glenguar, where he speaks about some uh, analogies between uh, the, the drug policy we have now with many drugs illegal, and the Index Librorum, the list of books that were uh, illegal to manufacture and to read during the Middle Age because of the Inquisition. So I think it's a very interesting parallelism because uh, the goal of the Church, of the Inquisition, actually was to uh, prohibit the possibility to access certain ideas so at the end uh, the point was not to make legal font or, or paper and books but uh, to really make an accessible certain way of thinking we can say that actually what's happening now with the drug prohibition is something very similar because uh, what uh, is illegal now is basically the possibility to access certain state of consciousness so i will now read some uh, quotes from Richard Glenmore. The effort to prohibit these texts and to make criminals out of those who manufactured such texts were not so much interested in controlling ink patterns or paper as in controlling the ideas encoded in printed words. In the same way, the so called war on drugs is not a war on pills, power, plants, and potions. It is a war on mental states, a war on consciousness itself. The war on drugs is a war on what sort of mental states we are permitted to experience and who gets control of it. Now, another very interesting part of his articles are about uh, George Orwell and his beautiful novel 1984. In this novel, George Orwell draws uh, a scenario where the people who have power try to eliminate certain words from the vocabulary so that certain kind of ideas become not even thinkable by the population. So I will quote Richard Glenbois about this. In George Orwell novel 1984, the Oceania government worked to establish Newspeak, a carefully crafted language designed for making unapproved modes of thoughts impossible. Before Newspeak, the people of Oceania communicated with Oldspeak, a natural language capable of expressing multiple points of view. By controlling language through the imposition of new speak, by eliminating certain words, the government of Oceania was able to control and in some cases completely extinguish certain thoughts. Those people raised with new speak, having never known the wide range of old speak, might fail to notice that the government was limiting consciousness. This for me is very interesting because I feel the same. I feel I've been raised up in a society where these drugs were already legal. And when trying to speak with my peers, with people of my age, about what is not available to us, it's difficult because they, they never experienced a situation where these substances were legal, where these uh, tools to accessing state of consciousness were available. And the situation for me now is that uh, only few people, which at the moment are very old, like Stanislav Grof or Claudia Naranjo, had the chance to grow up in a society where the situation was different, where these substances were not illegal and where scientists could study them in different scientific or therapeutic settings. But uh, excluding these few people from that generation, all the other people had the chance eventually to experiment with the substance in uh, another completely different kind of setting, like a recreational setting or in any case illegal settings, with very few exceptions. So 
So, so this is uh, something that really touched me when I read that article. And uh, I will continue with the article by Richard Glenbois. In 1970, the United States government produced the Index of Forbidden Thought Catalyst, the Federal Schedule of Controlled Substances. Included on the initial list of Schedule I substances were substances such as psilocybin, DMT, ibogaine, mescaline, LSD. The experience elicited by these substances is the equivalent of old speak, a cognitive modality dating from prehistory. Just as the new speak was intended to make certain old thought literally unthinkable, so the war on entheogens makes certain sort of cognition and awareness inaccessible. Basically, the conclusion is that the war on entheogens, the war on drugs, is a battle of the nature of thought itself. And those who have never experienced the mental states that are now prohibited do not realize what the laws are denying them. It is as if nothing is being taken away. Only those who have been initiated into the modern day mysteries, those who have tasted the forbidden fruit from the visionary plants of knowledge, are aware of the gravity of what is being prohibited, powerful modalities for thinking, perceiving and experiencing. So the advocate for entheogenic consciousness is left in an even worse position than the man who must describe colors to a blind person. The position is worse because the blind are in power and have declared a crime to see colors. So in the next slide I decided to put some data about how many people are at the moment incarcerated, for example in the United States, more than 2 million people. Because we know that uh, a big percentage of these people are, uh, have been incarcerated because of drug laws, and many of them for non-violent drug crimes. So this means that we have a huge number of people that has been incarcerated for laws that uh, are not actually respecting human rights, are not taking into account uh, what, uh, for example, our constitution say, uh, our declaration of human rights says, as for example about uh, the right, uh, the freedom of thought, the right to the freedom of religion, and as well the, the access to the right to health. And uh, I will conclude the quote by Richard Glenoir with this sentence Left with the impossible task of describing the indescribable, those who have tasted the forbidden fruit plead their case on the philosophical and political level of what it means to be truly free. This brings us to cognitive freedom as an essential substrate of freedom. The right to control one's own consciousness is the quintessence of freedom. Cognitive liberty is the invisible landscape from which springs some of our most protected freedoms. So basically what is interesting for me about uh, the Center for Cognitive Liberty is the fact that it draws attention to the fact, to, to this simple fact that most of our protected freedom uh, are, are coming from this essential freedom, which is the freedom to modify our consciousness, our brain chemistry. If we do not have total freedom about that, we cannot consider ourselves truly free. And uh, it's very interesting that other people started to write articles and books about this subject. And uh, another person that has been giving a very great contribution about the subject is uh, Charlotte Walsh, who wrote a, a very good article in a book titled Prohibition, Religious Freedom and Human Rights, Regulating Traditional Drug Use. And she wrote, it has been argued here that we need to go beyond the claims of religious and therapeutic freedom when disputing the prohibitive drug laws and their compatibility, compatibility with human rights and obli obligations. This is exactly something I think we need to start thinking, to go beyond just claiming therapeutic rights, to go beyond religious freedom, but start to speak about something that uh, at the end includes all these rights, the rights to uh, self-medicate, the right to religion, the basically freedom of thought, because this is what we are talking about also. And uh, I would like also to 
to speak about uh, the fact that at the moment I believe there are many people around the world who believe in this, but they're not really politically organized. And uh, I think it's time to bring into reality the vision of uh, an article that has been written in 2003 by Julie Ritz-Sierra. She wrote an article titled Is it time for a cognitive liberty social movement? And in this article she is envisioning the emergence of a network of people advocating for cognitive liberty, organizing themselves in order to put this issue in the political agenda. And uh, I would like to quote uh, a part of this article, which I think brings uh, awareness about what's special about cognitive liberty, what's, what this movement could bring to the international debate that is already taking place about uh, drug policy reform. Basically, she believes that uh, this movement could bring this, could bring the fact that drug laws are not just bad because they produce a lot of harm for people, but uh, because they, they basically uh, not allow to the general public to access many benefits that are linked with the consumption of certain substances. This is the point. And this is the point that the harm reduction movement has not been advocating for because it's not his core business, we could say. And this is exactly what the cognitive liberty movement could bring in the international debate. In fact, Julie Ritz wrote in his article, why harm reduction draws on public health principle and core ideals of privacy and compassion it fails to frame the drug policy debate in terms of widely held fundamental values. It is precisely by reframing what drug prohibition means that cognitive liberty makes its greatest contribution to the drug policy reform movement. So that's why I believe, as she wrote, that it's essential now that uh, pre-existing network support the emergence of this movement because there is something unique that this movement could bring into the international debate. So to conclude my presentation, I would like to quote again this article. Julie Roots, she wrote at the end, on a personal level, we can begin by claiming our right to cognitive liberty. We can discuss cognitive liberty in public every chance we get. Perhaps the biggest contribution anyone can make is getting involved support organizations that defend cognitive liberty. People are the indispensable resource of any social movement and cognitive liberty is relying on you now more than ever. This article has been written in 2003. Now I think it's really time to make it happen. So thank you for your attention and thank you ISERS for the possibility to give this presentation.